First in number 70, 18, a row against Wade. The first plaintiff was Jane Rowe. In the original action, she was joined by a married couple, John and Mary Doe. Their primary interest, the question of whether or not they will be forced by the state uh, to continue an unwanted pregnancy. There are some who say equality for the pre-born, it's contrary to the liberation of women. You know, that perspective is really pitting women against their children. You would agree, I suppose, that one of the important factors that has to be considered in this case is what rights, if any, does the unborn fetus have? There have been two cases that expressly hold that a fetus has no constitutional rights. Feminism is based on human equality. You can't just leave some humans out. It's what the pro-life feminist wants for everyone. I look up to people like Maya Angelou. Um, I remember where I was when I picked up I Know Where the Cage Bird Sings. There was a time when she didn't even speak uh, because she had been you know, sexually abused and she just stopped talking. She was voiceless, right? And um, she talked about how her grandma would just, uh, you know, braid her hair and, and she would say, baby, I know one day you're gonna speak and when you open up your mouth, you're gonna change the world. What kind of a loss would we as a society, as a, as a nation, as a world have if she had stayed because of her trauma in that place of being voiceless? She said, this is what it means to be a phenomenal woman. That's who I am, phenomenal woman. And she inspired so many women to be phenomenal women. I moved around a lot uh, as a child. I actually spent first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and then the fifth grade in different schools because my parents divorced. Like, I always read books. I wasn't really, like, sporty. I was shy. I don't know what you would say, like, awkward, maybe. like. People tease me a lot growing up. I was teased a lot. I had a, it was kind of tough. Really comparing myself to even other people and my family and my friends and feeling like I was the awkward one. And I'd always known that, you know, I was, I was born out of wedlock. My parents weren't married and I knew that they tried to make it work for a year and I knew that they got divorced and, but I didn't know all the details. And so she began to tell me and she said, you're gonna hate me. And my mom and me are very close. I love my mom. I said, Mom, I would never hate you. Like, I would never hate you. But she said, no, you're going to hate me. My dad had two kids at the time. There was some pressure there from him to have an abortion. She didn't receive any kind of options counseling. The lady just said to her, well, this seems like the best decision for you to make. And they took her money, and they put her in a white hospital robe. And she sat in the hallway, just really trying to collect herself. There was an elderly African-American woman at the other end of the hallway, and she was the janitor, and she began to approach my mom. She ended up lifting up her chin. She looked in her eyes and said, you know, do you want to have this baby? And she said yes. She put her head down. The lady began to walk away, but it was a long hallway, and my mom looked up maybe 20 seconds later, and my mom said she was gone. The doctor called her name. When she walked into his office, there was blood on the floor. And she said, I'm leaving. And he said, no. He said, you've already paid for this. You're just gonna go through with it. But she ran out and um, she like ran down the stairs and she called my dad in the payphone. And she said, you know, come and get me. Um, and she told him that she didn't go through with it. And to my dad's credit, you know, they tried to make it work, they got married. And they tried their best to make it work and it didn't work for them, but it worked for me. <laughs> My mom got pregnant with me when she was 19 years old at the University of Texas and um, got married when I was nine months old. And it was kind of a tumultuous relationship. They got pregnant with my brother and then um, got divorced before I was five. She got remarried when I was eight and they ended up getting divorced when I was 13. So, I mean, there was kind of a lot of moving around and stuff. My brother and I were incredibly close, especially when we were trying to strangle each other. When my brother was 18 and I was 21, he got in a car accident and passed away. I think I've always been a feminist. I think um, 
you know, I've kind of joked that I'm like the man-made feminist. I've had a series of men who I've either witnessed them treating women in my family and in my life poorly or, you know, myself. The powerlessness was something that I think, that's when I became a feminist. That's when it was like, I'm gonna grow up and I'm gonna learn to protect myself and have that strength. Throughout my life, you know, I've, I've kind of rebelled and, and definitely bought into this culture that told me that my sexuality was my power and this is where I was gonna garner all of my strength over men, right? And so at 16, I found myself pregnant and I remember being so angry, so angry at myself that, you know, if anybody knew better than to repeat this cycle, it was me because I know how hard it is for both the woman and the child. When I was 16, I was in an on-again, off-again relationship with a guy, and, um, you know, I'd been sleeping around, and he and I had been in this, you know, very weird, strange relationship, because I told him, you know, I'm not comfortable, like, having sex anymore, like, can we please not, and he didn't want to stay in a relationship anymore if it meant we weren't having sex, right? So we broke up, um, and on Valentine's Day, um, he raped me. A couple months go by, still no period. I um, was really struggling with this idea of like, what if I was pregnant by my rapist of all people, right? One day, you know, he comes and pulls me out of class and he says, Amy, you need to get an abortion. Like, I'll take you, I'll pay for it, but we need to get this taken care of. And so I'm just kind of standing there, you know, jaw agape, like, but, you know, I was panicking because, of course, it was the, it was, it had already been top of my mind. He said, you know, I just, I don't think I could tell my mom about what happened. That was his reason. Um, he said to me, like, Amy, if you don't get an abortion, I might kill you. That suddenly everything clicked. Like, I was like, oh, abortion's not the answer. It was because I realized that I couldn't do what he was doing to me. That he was telling me, like, you're an inconvenience to me. You're an inconvenience to my future. Therefore, I'm going to kill you. So what right did I have to do that same exact thing? I had already taken ninth grade biology, right? Like, I knew what was going on. I guess I just thought that the violence was okay up until that point. But when I became convinced of this pro-life position, I looked up, you know, organizations that fit in with who I was as a person. Like, at 16, I was an atheist. I was, of course, a feminist, um, you know, very liberal. And um, I was also, like, openly queer. And so I was like, what, is the, what, like, what does being pro-life mean for me as a person? Like, how do I fit into this larger movement, right? And so Feminist for Life was the first organization that I found. I uh, was so thrilled to find out that they existed. I was like, yay, like I have a place. We were sponsored for the Women's March on Washington. I made it very clear from the jump that we were pro-life. Once it became more public, and there was this Twitter storm of you know prominent pro-choice feminists who were demanding we be removed, and um, it was the best thing that ever happened to us. I owe them all like a fruit basket now. Suddenly it was BBC and NPR and Vice. They were finally listening to that message that this is not about oppressing women. Um, this is about helping women, empowering women, empowering them to be able to choose life. We tried to enter an an like multiple different anti-war marches lately because you know, we're an anti-war organization too. They kicked us out of both of them because we are a pro-life organization. Um, and they're like, we can't work with you because you support imperialism over women's bodies. Uh, as soon as I, you know, send them a Facebook friend request and realize that they're going to see that I use the word pro-life in something, like, I have to give this disclaimer, like, I'm pro-life, but, 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 I'm not, I don't scream at women, but, you know, it really is about compassion and helping people. And then they're like, okay, we can be friends on a trial basis. that must be decided on the Constitution. 
We do not disagree that there is a progression of fetal development. It is the conclusion to be drawn from that upon which we disagree. We are not here to advocate abortion. We do not ask this court to rule that abortion is good or desirable in any particular situation. We are here to advocate that the decision as to whether or not a particular woman will continue to carry or will terminate a pregnancy is a decision that should be made by that individual. That in fact she has a constitutional right to make that decision for herself. Here it's the question of whether or not the state by the statute will force the woman to continue. You are urging upon us abortion on demand of the woman alone. That in the Baird versus Eisenstadt case, this court said if the right of privacy is to mean anything, it is the right of the individual, whether married or single, to make determinations for themselves. If you're a man, you know, the pro-choice movement says, shut up, unless you agree with us. If you agree with us, then you can be pro-choice. You can be pro-choice, you know, pro-choice. You can stand up for us. In fact, you should stand up for us. But if you do not agree with us, then shut up. You don't have a uterus, so you don't have an opinion. And that's a chant, you know, no uterus, no opinion. Do you know what it's like to be pregnant? They'll take it up a notch. Do you know what it's like to be raped? Well, I mean, I think most men are gonna say, I'm backing out. I'm the woman once known as the Jane Roe of Roe versus Wade, but I dislike the name Jane Roe and all that it stands for. I am a real person named Norma McCorby. My lawyers were looking for a young white woman to be a guinea pig for a new social experiment. I made the story up that I had been raped to help justify my desire for an abortion. I never had an abortion, and while I was once an advocate for abortion, I would later come to deeply regret that I was partially responsible for the killing between 40 to 50 million human beings. I am Sandra Cano. I never knew I was involved in Dobie Bolton until almost to the end. I'm just a regular woman that was put in a lawyer's case that had an agenda to do. She used me because I was naive and vulnerable. Granted, I was pregnant, my life was unstable. The last thing I needed was another child. But under no circumstances would I sign an affidavit stating I wanted to take my baby's life. I never applied for this abortion. I never applied for that case. It was done without my knowledge. So I have been the victim here. There's been this historical oppression. There's been this disenfranchisement of women. As pro-life feminists, we understand, acknowledge, and work to end the historical oppression of those of us who have wounds, right? There's a word I love called sonder. It means to understand that every other human being with whom you ever interact has a life as vivid and complex as your own. There's all these different intersecting identities, and one thing I think that we all have in common that we forget about is that we were all embryos. I think I, like many millennial women, I'm just, we had seen kind of the worst of feminism. You know, Gloria Steinem saying, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. And just seeing anger and seeing that push for abortion, and that being so connected to feminism to the point where you can't even say that you are a feminist if you're pro-life without backlash. I just didn't feel like that was my message. That's the thing, people are like, oh, you don't support reproductive rights. I mean, that's <laughs> entirely false. I support, you know, this massive list of, of reproductive rights. Once there's a preborn child there, the reproduction has already happened. I 
I just thought about my family, and I've grown up in a family of mostly women, uh, women who have been abused um, through domestic violence and women who've been rejected, mistreated. Uh, my mom, my aunts, um, survivors, strong women, strong women. My Auntie Sherry, my Auntie Jackie, my mom, my Auntie Sandy, my Auntie Mamala, I mean, they can do anything. And I always looked to them for a source of strength and comfort and I thought, you know, this is what it's like to be a feminist, you know, to be a strong woman. And then I looked at African-American women that I loved, like Sojourner Truth, like, like Harriet Tubman, and I looked at their lives and their strength, and I realized, you know, Christina, you are fighting for women all the time. Um, that's your heart, you know, to fight for them. If they're in an abusive relationship, if they're being mistreated, if they're being told by society that they can't do something, they can't go to school and have a child, you know, um, if they're being mistreated at work and they're facing pregnancy discrimination, I'm not okay with injustice, you know, in any way, shape, or form towards women. And so I kind of came to this realization that I am a feminist and it's okay. It's okay because I'm going to redefine it. And to think that because we value the littlest women of all, <laughs> just as much as any other woman at any other stage in her life, means that we are against womanhood or we're disconnected to the reality of the pains and the struggle and the trauma associated with being a woman, are we not women? You know, do, not, do we not hurt and ache in the same way? The pro-life side, a lot of times, they see one person, they see the unborn child. And the feminist side sees one person, they see the woman. But pro-life feminists see two people. We want to protect and support two people. Would you lose your case if, it, if the fetus was a person? Then you would have a balancing of interest. It seems to me that you do not balance constitutional rights of one person against mere statutory rights of another. Well, do I get from this then that your case depends primarily on the proposition that the fetus has no constitutional rights? Even if the court at some point determined the fetus to be entitled to constitutional protection, you would still get back into the weighing of one life against another. And that's, what, that's what's involved in this case? Weighing one life against another? No, Your Honor. I said that would be what would be involved if the, the facts were different and the state could prove that there was a person for the constitutional right. At this time, there is no indication to show that the Constitution would give any protection prior to birth. Second and third wave movements really, um, you know, put this focus on liberation, which is fine in the context of equality. The reason why equality is crucial is because all of us have this inherent humanity, you know, this inherent human dignity. Then it means that nonviolence is key. You know, non-discrimination is crucial. But if you put liberation above equality. That's, I think, where it becomes problematic. I mean, honestly, these are the stories that I've heard from women, how much abortion can benefit some men. It really enables them to treat women like a toy, you know? My toy's broken. My toy's broken. She's pregnant. Go over there. Get that abortion. Here's some money for it. Well, my toy's fixed. You know, we can go back to doing whatever we were doing. Connecticut, the state that I live in, we don't have parental notification laws. And that means that a 15-year-old girl can get an abortion without even telling her parent. I'm not talking about consent. I'm not talking about your parents' approval. I'm talking about notifying your parents. And you're getting an abortion. And guess who that benefits? The fact that they don't have to notify their parents. Pimps, Johns, people that will take them from other states and abuse them. You know, where's the feminist for these women? If you stand outside of any abortion clinic, I've done a lot of sidewalk counseling in my past, you will inevitably see a father or boyfriend who has the girl by the arm and she's crying as they're walking her in that door. And so don't tell me for one second that that is a woman's choice.
if you think about the fact that, you know, the toxicity of abortion here in the U.S., you know, the fact that most of our abortion clinics are in low-income communities, we're sending a very clear message that if you're impoverished, then abortion needs to be the solution and taking it to other countries and saying, you know, if you're dealing with uh, patriarchal systems where you're being raped and abused and treated like property, um, then here, here's the abortion Band-Aid that we use in America. That doesn't unrape a woman. That doesn't change a system where she's very, very oppressed. It does nothing except for give her another wound. It's oppressive to women and stops us from addressing the real issues of our time. Look at gender side. Look at all these girls in China and parts of Asia and India who are dying just because they're a girl. They're being aborted just because they're a girl. They're being put in orphanages. Where is the feminist cry? When it comes to women in the inner cities, women who are making abortion decisions, often it's like, well, the best decision for you is not to have that kid because why well, have a kid that's going to grow up poor? Why well, have a kid that's going to grow up, et cetera, et cetera, without a dad? And of course, we know that children born in different situations, they do suffer and it's difficult, but they're also the ones that overcome. Why would we want to wipe out all of our overcomers? You know, someone goes from being in a single parent home to becoming president, you know, they go from not having a dad or uh, not having a strong foundation to become a doctor or a lawyer and we say, wow, look at that, look at President Obama, look at Ben Carson, that's awesome. You know, they don't want to bring a child into the world that has Down syndrome or any other kind of sickness. And I don't fully even know how hard that is, I really don't know, um, but I know that there's a lie that says that that child's less valuable. Many people may not necessarily feel like they can identify with the label of being pro-life. They don't feel like they can connect to it because they think it represents someone that's not like them. So in their minds, they hear pro-life and they think white, Republican, conservative person. Um, and maybe a white, Republican, conservative person who's not in their neighborhood. They're looking to see action where it counts, you know, in the inner cities, building community, um, loving on women, helping single moms. Sometimes, you know, the white pro-life community will say, Planned Parenthood does all these horrible things. You know, for some in the black community, they say, but I only see Planned Parenthood. I don't see you. Find out what's going on in their community and find out what they need. You know, what do you need? A pregnancy center. I mean, girls come to the pregnancy center I work for. Um, they come from multiple cities. They'll take two buses. They'll, they'll come for hours to get diapers and clothes. Um, some girls come in and they are coming because they are making a pregnancy decision. They want an ultrasound for free. They want a pregnancy test. They want options counseling. Other girls come in nine months pregnant. But we're going to walk with them for the rest of their pregnancy and for two years afterwards. And for two years they can come in uh, and they can get clothes and diapers and support and prayer and resources because we care about that. The pro-life movement was actually very liberal historically very rooted in equality movements. And it wasn't until after the Democratic Party actually made abortion like part of their platform that the Republican Party then like swooped in and was like, oh, we're gonna be the party of life, which is very interesting because supporting the recognition of rights for more humans is actually a very progressive policy, if you think about it, right? Like, in what other case would it be like, oh, giving rights to more humans, that's regressive, that's oppressive. <laughs> I mean, I think there is a need in general like for the pro-life movement to be more inclusive, to like be a welcoming space for people of all different backgrounds. Because if you want to end abortion, like if you want to end any form of injustice, right, like you need everyone to believe that. If you have slavery, but you only have half the country that wants to end slavery, you're going to have a problem. transfusion case where there is a decision already made by the woman that she desires to carry the pregnancy to term. And when that
that decision is made, that the child should be given every opportunity to come into life a healthy person. We do not believe that that necessitates the conclusion that, therefore, under the Constitution, prior to birth, a person under the 14th Amendment would exist. Scott Peterson, who killed Lacey Peterson and their baby, and um, got, you know, double murder charges. What does it say? Well, because the woman wanted the baby, that, therefore, that's considered murder. But in a case where the child's not wanted, it's considered a right. For many women, they're not really thinking about it until the moment that they look at the stick and they realize they're pregnant or their friend's pregnant. And then they have to pull on what they've heard and what do they know? And maybe they went to a church and they heard abortions back and they're like, okay, well, what else have they heard? You know, what else have they seen in the media? Well, they've seen, um, you know, abortion, you know, portrayed as a sign of how much of a liberated woman you are. And it's beyond just removing the stigma. You know, campaigns on Twitter like, you know, shout your abortion. It's growing on a host, it can't take care of itself, it's totally dependent, it's the actual word saying it's a parasite. The girls that I work with, they're like, yeah, it's a baby. Why do you think I'm terrified about it? Because <laughs> they know it's a baby. It's hard for them to give that compassionate care to someone growing inside of them when they feel like they've not received that from the world around them. You know, along the way, there was a lot of hemming and hawing about what is the pre-born. I, mean, I think we finally come to the point as a culture where a majority of pro-choice people will admit it's a human, it's a life. They think that a woman has a right to refuse, a right to do whatever she wants within her body. It's like, I'm willing to have that discussion. If people are like, it's not a human, I'm like, come on guys. Like, People always make the argument, oh, well, abortion has always been happening, it's still gonna happen. And like, they're not necessarily wrong unless we have an entire cultural shift where the pro-life movement is going to be inclusive, where it's going to be welcoming, where it is going to acknowledge this, this human rights argument. A place where I would have felt comfortable as 16-year-old me. Whether you're Maya Angelou or whether you're someone who the world will never know your name. Every human being has value. Most people are very uncomfortable with late-term abortions. Most people, even who say they're pro-choice, will say, I'm uncomfortable with that, I don't like that. Well, why? <laughs> well, because it's a baby then. It's a baby because it's more fully developed. Is it not a baby before? So we're always looking for the line. But for me, I say it doesn't matter. I could have been aborted at six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks. I'm not here. That's the point. If it were established that an unborn fetus is a person within the protection of the 14th Amendment, you would have almost an impossible case here, would you? I would have a very difficult case. Certainly would.